And welcome, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Uh, as Michael said, I'm Kira, Kira Epstein, the program coordinator for the New School at Commonweal. And today we'll be talking about easing cancer pain and suffering with Dr. Thomas Smith, our host, Michael Lerner, and the Cancer Choices team. So this conversation is part of our co-presented series with, with Commonweal's Cancer Choices program. And I just want to send many thanks over to Nancy Pohl, or um, Laura Pohl and Nancy Hepp for bringing this series together. And there are many other conversations in the series, which you can find on our websites. And that's um, the new schools is tns.commonweal.org. And Cancer Choices is cancerchoices.org. And you can find all of our recordings on the new schools, SoundCloud, YouTube, Apple Podcasts, and Spotify feeds. Okay, I think that's all my housekeeping. So I'm going to turn it over to Michael and Tom. Again, thanks for joining us at the new school at Commonweal. Thank you, Kira. And Dr. Tom Smith, a warm welcome uh, to the new school at Commonweal and Cancer Choices. We're so honored and grateful that you're with us. So, my name's Tom Smith. I'm an oncologist and palliative care specialist at Johns Hopkins in, in Baltimore. I was 28 years at the Virginia Commonwealth University Medical College of Virginia and then came here 11 years ago to help expand the pain and palliative care program. And, and I often still get asked, why is an oncologist so interested in pain? And should, it all, to me, it always seemed obvious. Cancer-related pain is the second most common complaint that people have about their suffering. Actually, number one is fatigue. Go back, turn your clock back to 1984, when I started my hematology oncology training at MCV ECU, and almost all of the docs there were just chemotherapy givers. They're not paying attention to the real person, um, not interested in helping them grow through the experience, but. There was one person, Dr. Galen Wampler, who had this deep, gravelly voice. He said, well, if, if you want to, if they want to know what's going to happen to them, you should tell them. But just be as honest as you can. And pay attention to suffering, especially pain. And that really struck home for me because that was the way I was wired from the beginning. Um, I finished my fellowship after a couple years in the lab in 1979, and in the late 1980s and early 1990s, a group of five or six of us started adding sections on open and honest communication and symptom control to the American Society of Clinical Oncology annual meeting, where we get together with 53,000 of our closest friends from all around the world. So we would add communication to a section on nausea and vomiting control. And we started adding sections on pain management. We actually made a curriculum for oncologists. Uh, I think we sold about two copies of it, which tells you the interest back then. We were widely known in the oncology community as a quote, lunatic fringe, end quote. Um, but the movement kept growing. Uh, we, we kept at it. It recruited more people. And now at least 10% of the oncology board exam questions are based on palliative care, which is symptom management, open and honest communication, finding support for the patient and family, working on advanced directives and working on legacy. So most programs that have a robust palliative care program all the oncologists, surgical, gynoc, medoc, they all rotate through for two weeks to a month. I also myself have metastatic prostate cancer. Uh, 
So that gives me a little, little bit of credibility. Um, it also means that at some point I'm going to experience significant pain and I really want good pain control for myself. Uh, I should describe my implicit and explicit bias. And that's I'm data driven and I'm data driven from randomized controlled clinical trials. Um, just as an example, one of my colleagues just published the first good US trial of German mistletoe. German mistletoe is different than the American mistletoe. She treated 21 people and two of them actually had cancer shrinkage, um, documentable and the quality of life improved in, for some. Uh, and it didn't seem to have any extra toxicity. But now we need to see if that was just a fluke. And particularly the quality of life questions are so much interested, so much influenced by, hey, you're taking this brand new drug called mistletoe from Germany. Isn't your quality of life better? Um, we'll figure that out shortly. So my approach to pain, rather than asking what's your pain number, is to try to find out what's causing it. Is it neuro neuropathic damage to nerves from bony compression or tumor or radiation or surgery? Or the other categories are nociceptive, which is deep aching pain like the pain from can pancreas cancer. There's also visceral pain, like when your intestines get blocked or your kidneys get blocked. And one of the worst things to treat is called movement pain, when you have two bones that are involved with cancer, metastases, and every time they move, they just um, hurt like crazy. And most of the things we do don't do very much for that. Our understanding of cancer pain has dramatically increased over the past five years. We used to think it was just the cancer pushing things out of the way or the cancer damaging the nerves. But it turns out if you stick a really small needle right down next to where the cancer's in the bone and pull out a tiny drop of fluid and then inject that fluid into the bloodstream or someplace else in the body, the whole nervous system goes on high alert. So there are these small chemical compounds produced by your own body called neuropeptides that um, seem to mediate the pain more than anything else. I'll also ask people, what's a good pain goal for you? Would, be, would four be okay? Would six be okay? Would two be okay? Uh, if somebody says zero, no pain at all, um, and they've got a serious illness, I may have to say that may not be possible, but if we can get your pain down below four, you won't be thinking about pain all the time. You get any time a pain score is six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10, most of the time you're just thinking about pain, not thinking about any of the other things that should be happening in your life. So then I'll ask a number. What's your average pain? What's your worst pain? What's your least pain? Are there things that make it better? Are there things that make it worse? And that will give me clues as to what's causing it. Finally, after that 20 questions, you try to build a layer cake of relief, starting with acetaminophen or Tylenol. Um, it's easy to take. It works by a completely different mechanism than any other um, pain, pain drug. And even people who are in whopping doses of morphine or oxycodone can sometimes get additional relief from three grams of Tylenol a day. If somebody has bone pain, we add non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs because they seem to be singularly effective for that. Um, so things like ibuprofen or Motrin Aleve or Naproxen, Aloxacam or Mobic, uh, whichever one. And it may take one or two trials of different drugs to see which one works for each individual person. Like my wife swears by aspirin. 
and Tylenol does nothing for her. On the other hand, aspirin does nothing for me, but Tylenol relieves my headaches and relieves my arthritic knees. And then you add drugs for nerve pain if it's nerve pain. None of, none of these actually go to fix the nerve. What they do is they change your brain biochemistry. So they raise your serotonin, raise your norepinephrine, and that helps your brain inhibit the pain responses coming up. Um, there are drugs like venlafaxine, gabapentin, or Neurontin, Pregabalin, or Lyrica. They all work in individuals, but they don't work all that well. Um, if you look at the clinical trials, most of the time, only one in three or one in five or one in seven people get a great response. So you have to find somebody who can work with you to try it. Do a three-week trial of one drug. If that doesn't work. Do a three, either add another drug or, do, or switch to a different drug. Um, and then opioids. Opioids actually work. They work quite well. Um, I, of course, am personally responsible for the opioid crisis in the United States because I <laughs> prescribed so much. Um, everybody knew what was going on. It's just greed, 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 greed. It's now gotten, it swung the opposite direction. So it's almost impossible sometimes to get the right doses of opioids for people. Pharmacies don't want to carry it. Um, I have to recertify every six months that the person still needs it, which is you know half an hour of paperwork for me. Um, a lot of pharmacies might have one type, but not another. So I'm, I'm often spending 45 minutes on the phone calling around the pharmacies, asking them if they have fentanyl patches. Do you have oxycodone 40 milligram tablets? And technically they're not supposed to tell me because I could be somebody who's gonna come by and rob them, but most of the time they're, they're pretty reasonable. Opioids do work for nerve pain too. One of the fallacies I was taught in medical school and residency and even oncology fellowship was opioids don't work for nerve pain like shingles pain or back pain where the nerves are compressed or surgical damage to a nerve. They don't work great, but they do work and they work especially good in combination with drugs like nortripoline and, and gabapentin. So you're trying to build on top until you finally achieve enough pain relief without too many side effects. I have done some research on pain. Um, we did a large trial in five different countries with 202 cancer patients who were really sick. They had to be on at least 200 milligrams of morphine, uh, expected to live at least three months and have inadequate pain control. So they had to have a pain score of eight, nine or 10. Uh, most of them were on opioids plus one or two other drugs. Half of the group we sent to the best pain managers we could find and tried switching the drugs around. The others got an implantable drug delivery system about the size of a hockey puck or a pacemaker that goes under your skin and feeds in through a tiny little catheter drugs right into your spinal fluid. So they're bathing the pain nerves with pain drugs. And one milligram of morphine in your spinal fluid is equal to 300 by mouth. So oftentimes you could dramatically reduce the number of milligrams that a patient was on. You can also put local anesthetics like lidocaine or novocaine or a long acting one like bupivacaine in. We all know those work. Most of us have, most of us have had dental work done. You know, they work and they work very quickly. You can do the same thing with a little bit of bupivacaine in the spinal fluid. So we saw a 62% reduction in pain scores, which was really pretty remarkable for this group that really didn't have any other options. 
And I was very interested in making sure that we weren't harming people by putting in these pumps in people getting chemotherapy and radiation, that they would get infected, that they fall on them, they break. We didn't have any single accidents with pumps. But when we looked at survival, the group that got their pain relieved actually lived 102 days longer. And that's sort of the first proof we had that relieving symptoms not only is a good thing for in and of itself, but relieving symptoms allows you to live longer. I don't think it does anything to the cancer, but I think it might keep you going to synagogue, might keep you going to little league games, might keep you walking around the block or going to the dinner table if you don't hurt so much. Some things we're working on now include scrambler therapy. If you Google scrambler therapy, it'll, you might be interested in reading about it. You can do spinal cord stimulation where you put two little wires right along the spinal cord and you put them right on the pain, the pain tracks, which are right at the top, back of the spinal cord, and then hook it up to a charge generator that puts some electrical stimulation into the spinal cord and can reduce pain as much as 60 or 70 percent. However, it's invasive, it's expensive, wires can fall off, they can move, you know, it's just not satisfactory. So an inventor in Italy came up with a way to do it um, superficially. So I, that's what I was doing early this morning. I was taking EKG electrodes and putting them on very specific spots on the skin above and below the pain and reducing people's pain. One guy had pain from neuropathy midway up his shins. It was nine out of 10 on Monday. Today it was zero. And he, his numbness was better and his tingling was better. All the pain drugs don't do anything for numbness and tingling, which is oftentimes as bad as the pain from neuropathy. He was actually jogging down the hall. I wish I'd taken a video of it. So that's very exciting. Um, hopefully there'll be a, a big article coming out in the New England Journal of Medicine in the next couple of months uh, that might stimulate some more interest in it. We also do ear acupressure. So I, I had this done on me when I was getting chemotherapy and radiation therapy. Uh, Chow Sing Young, who's a doctor of nursing and my colleague in these studies, um, came over and took little tiny seeds from the vicaria plant. They were smaller than mustard seeds on a really sticky piece of tape. And you put them on very specific spots of the ear, both the front and the back. And it's almost like there's a little human baby coiled up inside the ear. Arms and legs are up here, brain is down here. Um, and we saw in our first 15 patients with bad chemo neuropathy, we saw a 50% reduction in pain, a 50% reduction in numbness, 50% reduction in tingling, and a 50% reduction in stiffness. So we're really excited about that. We're doing a 225 um, patient trial. Um, just to see if there's some easier way than if, if we can teach people to put the beads on by video. All you do is you press them, squeeze, release, squeeze, release, squeeze, release. You press them for three minutes, three times a day. Your ear will get tender as heck, but my knees stop turning and my breathing improves. Um, acupuncture. Uh, we have one acupuncturist for all of John Hop Johns Hopkins. Uh, it's typically not covered by insurance, so it's out of pocket. I mean, there's the American Society of Clinical Oncology issued some guidelines on integrative and complementary care late last year. And there's clear cut proof that it helps with nausea and vomiting. There's pretty clear cut proof that it helps with the stiffness, particularly in the wrists and elbows and knees that you get with some breast cancer drugs called aromatase inhibitors. Um, there's not a whole lot of evidence 
good evidence that it helps with chemotherapy induced peripheral neuropathy, and that's been my experience that it it doesn't help. There's so many variables that go into that. It's your own belief system. It's the expertise of the person putting them in. It's the own pain chemical makeup of the person that they're putting them in, and probably are combinations of those. But we did endorse massage. If that helps, um, cannabis is has been um, hard to prove that it relieves pain rather than just dissociates you from the pain. As an oncologist, as a palliative care person, I don't care. I really don't care. Um, as long as it helps. So I have plenty of patients where I've certified them for medical cannabis. Um, I have people taking as little as five milligrams a day and one face person taking 200 milligrams twice a day. One of the hottest new treatments in cancer medicine is immunotherapy. You've all seen the ads for Keytruda and Optivo on TV. Who wouldn't want to live six months longer from lung cancer? And things like melanoma and kidney cancer, they really work very well for it. Uh, just a note of caution, there are two studies from Israel that say that CBD and THC actually interfere with the immune system. So if, if you're taking THC or CBD, make sure you talk to your immunotherapist before you um, continue using them. We also stress meditation. About one or two percent of our um, palliative care consults are, can you come up and teach this person to meditate? So we built that into our uh, electronic medical record. I recommend the Calm app because it's so easy to, to use. The UC, if you Google UCLA MARC, the Mindful Awareness Research Center, that is a great resource for free meditations anywhere from 10 minutes to 45 minutes. It also has really good explanations of the science. The Julie Bauer and my friend Patty Gantz have been working on this for 20 years, and um, it's not going to make the nerves heal, but what it might do is keep you from catastrophizing about the pain. You know, my patients with chemo neuropathy or myself when I have pain, um, they put their feet down on the floor and they say, blankety blank, my feet hurt and they're numb and tingling at the same time. Why is that? Because I got 12 cycles of chemotherapy. Why did I get the 12 cycles of chemotherapy? Because I had breast cancer. And now that you're starting to get into this rabbit hole of, is the cancer gonna come back? What's gonna happen to me? Um, so meditation can teach you to manage those thoughts. Um, uh, a, a little bit better. So that's about all I could think of. I'm happy to open open up the questions. I see one is UCLA M A R C. It's um, Mindful Awareness Research Center. Just Google UCLA M A R C. The question above that is about scrambler therapy. Uh, it's not. Experimental, it was actually approved for safety by the FDA back in 2009. And the growing number of places are, are using it. City of Hope has two. UCLA has a machine that's up and running. Mayo Clinic has two. The thing that is keeping it from um, more, more usage is, frankly, the reimbursement because Medicare generally sets prices for what they'll reimburse you for for procedures. Like if I stick a long wire along somebody's nerve in their abdomen or down their leg, I can bill $2,500 and get paid $2,500 by Medicare. But when they 
looked at the scrambler therapy of me just putting electrodes on people, and we'd already given them evidence that in Europe, 2,693 people had been treated without a single serious side effect. And then we've just looked at 1,200 people that we've treated or on clinical trials. We only saw three side effects. Well, one, two of them were a little bit of redness and irritation under the EKG electrode, and one of them was a little bruise under the EKG electrode. The Medicare said, it's not dangerous. You've already told us it's completely safe. Um, we're going to reimburse you at the same rate as a physical therapy tech putting on a TENS machine, $32 for 30 minutes. And that's not enough to pay for the machine, which costs $65,000, much less um, pay for the average pain physician salary, which ranges from $350,000 to, to $500,000. Um, Tom, this is really extraordinary. Um, I just um, let me start with um, the fact that you have for yourself and for many of your students uh, a tattoo on your arm with five key points about pain management, and you've distributed thousands. You have it in Arabic and other languages, right? What what are the five points? We can't see that. What could you read them to us? Sure. So we have a lot of learners here. I've personally bought about ten thousand of these and distributed them. Um, I realized, as a breast cancer doctor, I had a spiel, a set spiel, for saying, "I think you need adjuvant chemotherapy. The drugs we're going to give you is this. These are the side effects." This is when you should call me. Here's my telephone number. But I didn't have a simple, easy way for starting a much harder conversation when somebody is seriously ill and perhaps even dying. So you put the tattoo on your forearm like this, um, and you can pretend you're a quarterback looking at your plays, and you say, how do you like to get medical information? Are you the sort of person who wants to know all the details or something else? Because there are about 10 or 15% of people who say, I just want to hear good news. I just want to hear what you're going to do for me. I don't want to hear any bad news. And I'm my typical truth, truthful self. I have on occasion barged in, not asked that question, and really destroyed a relationship that I was just starting to build as well as very much upsetting the family. And you can come back to that conversation many times during the course of the, of the illness. And the second question is, what is your understanding of your situation? <laughs> I'm, I'm told that works pretty well at home to, uh, honey, what's your understanding of the checkbook situation? <laughs> um, but that's the only way you're gonna find out do people think they're going to be cured when it's not possible? Do they think that they're only getting chemotherapy to live a few months longer when, in fact, they could be cured? I, mean, I have people out eight years now from their first dose of immunotherapy with no sign of their cancer, and they're probably cured. Their immune system's keeping it in check. So you know, what is your understanding of the situation? Number three is what is important to you. We actually have that on our intake sheet. We also have a question, what gives you joy? And try to make sure that people can do those things. When you're really sick, starting off, you, you have a lot more energy than you do when you're dying. And if, if somebody wants to complete some legacy work, like writing a book, doing a DVD of their life, um, making up with their brother that they haven't seen for 17 years, Now's the time to do it. So what's important to you? And number four is what are you hoping for? Um, some people will say, I'm only hoping for a cure. <laughs> Other people will say, I just want to live to see my granddaughter graduate from UVA um, in, in June. And then, <laughs> then you have to ask the question, well, how old is your granddaughter? <laughs> If she's three, it's probably going to be a problem. And then the last one is 
more um, behavioral interviewing. I lean in, I have an open po open poise, pose, pose um, and I say, have you thought about a time in the future when you might be sick enough to need an advanced directive or a living will? And most of the time, I would say 90% of the time today, people know what that is. It's my patient population. And 10% don't, you can explain that it's just a way of writing down what's important for you. So the first thing I want out of that conversation is, if you get so sick, you can't speak for yourself, who do you want to make medical decisions for you? And I'll tell people, it is a whole heck of a lot easier to have these discussions Thursday afternoon in the light than it is Thursday at 2 a.m. in the emergency room um, when the person's really sick. And most people get it. Now, I would guess uh, we probably have 50% of our patients with advanced medical directives now. So up from close to zero 11 years ago. So there, there are some other good meditation sites. One is called This Is Kara. This is Kara, K-A-R-A dot -A com. Um, Budify is another good one. Again, these are just helps to get you through without catastrophizing that today is going to suck just like yesterday. So, uh, Tom, you you have helped move palliative care and uh, alleviating pain from what you described as the fringe of oncology when you started to now 10% of the uh, questions on the exams are related to palliative care. But the average patient going to the average oncologist how likely would you say it is that they will encounter someone uh, who um, has the sensibility uh, to do the kind of work that all of us would want our oncologists to have? I think it's completely situational. Like here, um, we probably see one eighth of the cancer patients, and oftentimes it's very late in their course. The American Society of Clinical Oncology back in 2012 looked at the data from four big clinical trials, and number one, there was no harm at all from seeing palliative care. And, and the, the truth is, people who start with palliative care in the outpatient setting live longer and better than those who don't get palliative care been shown in a couple of studies and uh, it's just that relief of symptoms and relief of burden. Um, so we said that every seriously ill cancer patient or advanced cancer patient should be seen by a multidisciplinary palliative care team within eight weeks of diagnosis. So we knew that was completely impossible. So it was an aspirational goal. Um, there aren't enough palliative care people to do this. That's why we work very hard with our oncologists to uh, learn some of these skills, particularly the communication skills, you know, reflexive listening, not reacting too quick. You know, if somebody says, I'm really worried about dying, say, tell me more, rather than, oh, it's not gonna happen for a while. Um, and it, gives joy to me to be walking through the oncology clinic like I was this morning and hear one of the fellows say, what's important to you? What gives you joy? So they get it. And our fellows now have about 80% of their patients being seen by palliative care concurrently. So it is possible to, to do it. Just, we just, we can't hire enough people. Because is it not true that if you are anxious or depressed, that amplifies the pain signal? And 
therefore, is it not a useful uh, approach to treat anxiety and depression early in the treatment of pain? Because if you can reduce the anxiety and depression, you may tune down the pain signal and you may do so in a way that interferes less with the biology and quality of life than heavy duty pain medications. I would say amen to that. Um, and a lot of the antidepressants, the SNRIs, um, actually have anti-pain mechanisms of their own. So you may be killing two crabs with one stone. So anxiety and depression, we screen for um, one of my friends, Harvey Chochanoff, who's a psychiatrist in Winnipeg, Manitoba, had 169 patients hospitalized with cancer in their hospital. And he did the Beck Depression Inventory 12 question test. He did a thematic apperception test where you look at the picture and then describe. And then he had one of his fellows or residents do a 45 minute um, trained psychiatric interview. And then he asked them, are you depressed? Or since it's Canadian, are you depressed, eh? <laughs> and guess which instrument had 100% sensitivity and specificity for de detecting clinical depression? It was, mm -hmm. are you depressed? Or mm -hmm. are you, de over the past two weeks, have you been depressed most of the time? And even oncologists like me can learn how to do that and then start start treatment and even make a referral to a, a to a therapist. So couldn't agree and, more. And Vika Teicher says, what is the best way to do that if antidepressants aren't working? Um, what's the best way to relieve anxiety and depression? I think that's what she means. Okay. Um, remember that there are lots of different classes of antidepressants. And there are lots of times when a combination of antidepressants um, works a whole lot better. So I've, I've had terrible depression myself a couple times during my life, once during residency, and then once again when my prostate cancer was, I was getting radiation therapy and they gave me drugs to drop my testosterone to zero. Not only did it, um, the pills reduced my lung function by 50% so I could barely go upstairs. I got profoundly depressed because, you know, I'm a runner. All my friends are runners. That's my social activity. Um, I got really, really depressed. Actually hospitals, hospitalized myself for six, six days so I wouldn't kill myself. And the psychiatrist that I saw put me on an antidepressant called mirtazapine or Remeron, and it worked a little bit, gave me a lot of side effects. My, he retired. I saw another psychiatrist who's put me on Wellbutrin or Bupropion, and literally within a week, my mood was lifted. I was far less anxious. I was far more productive at work. I was feeling much more myself again with essentially no, no side effects. And my depression got a little bit worse, so we added a little bit of olanzapine. So you can add trace amounts of secondary drugs and often salvage depression treatment. That's where you need a good psychiatrist. I don't think oncologists like me or palliative care people should be managing complicated depression. And you should pair that almost certainly with some talk therapy and exercise and getting outside for 20 minutes a day and sitting in the sun. Uh, Tom, let me go to some rather deep questions of, um, in your own inner work in this field, which has been so extraordinary, uh, and you mentioned things like um, the importance of your belief system, um, 
what has been, and I, I'm not going to know how to frame this, but what has been your inner spiritual journey or psychological journey or whatever language you would put on it? Because you mentioned uh, that many oncologists are not interested in the growth potential of this journey. Well, you know, we have done 216 week-long retreats for cancer patients over the last 30 years for people who are profoundly interested in the growth possibility of this journey. And we have seen in the course of one week, lives be completely transformed in lasting ways, you know, that people remember for the rest of their lives. So you're operating in a, a medical setting with people with limited time and, and using all the pharmaceuticals and then all the adjunctive treatments you've described. And, and your work is unbelievably brilliant. But what has been your own journey into deeper questions that uh, pain and suffering uh, bring to us? And how are you able to talk to that when you are able to talk deeply either to colleagues or students or patients? Hmm. My own inner journey has been uh, up and down. Mm -hmm. um, I'm Quaker. And so one of the tenets of that is you don't need an intermediary to speak to God, that there's something of the special light in all of us. Um, and frankly, a lot of Quakers are more Buddhist than Quaker um, and may not even believe in a supreme being or but may believe in some spiritual force outside of themselves. Mm -hmm. That's sort of where I would place myself. But that's been a journey. I've had days where everything goes wrong and everybody dies and sometimes dies miserable deaths. And you've got the one that strikes me the most was having having a mom die of leukemia in the ICU and having literally to peel her three and seven year old kids off, off her, off her body, um, as gently as we could. You go home on a day like that and you think, what sort of God would do this? How can there possibly be some spiritual being overlooking us and thinking that this is okay? And then the next week, you might have a family that was completely fractured, who when grandma got really sick, they made up a schedule so they would spend, each spend time with her so she'd never be alone. They interviewed her and recorded it uh, so she'd have her life. I'm thinking of one 90-plus-year-old African-American woman. Just imagine the changes in her life that she's gone through. So in that case, you think somebody's really looking out for them. Um, it, it goes up and down. Mm -hmm. It sounds to me as if, in other words, I make a big distinction between empathy and compassion. And empathy is when you feel the pain of other people and compassion is when you feel compassion for their pain, but you don't take it on. Um, um, and I think being profoundly empathic is a much harder trail for a practitioner in the face of suffering all the time. I, I, but I sense that you may be a profoundly empathic and may take on a lot of this. Is that true or not? I, I think that's true. I probably take on too much. That's just who I am. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it started in medical school. It continued in residency. As an intern, I took a dying nun um, out to her uh, sister's wedding um, in an ambulance. You know, I called up the ambulance company from her small town in Philadelphia outside of Philly and said, could you come pick up sister so-and-so and I'll go with you. And this was before we had PCA pumps or patient controlled analgesia pumps. So I went down to the pharmacy and they, they basically handed me a cup full of Dilaudid syringes. <laughs> I'd have to sign them out. I'd 
And so every two hours, I would just give her two milligrams of Dilaudid. Um, it was one of the most rewarding experiences of my life, uh, as well as made it possible for uh, the sister to, to be there at a very important life event. Mm -hmm. So, yes, the em empathy can be too strong, but it also can be immensely rewarding. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, one of the, when you spoke of the importance of people's belief systems, uh, one, and, and then you spoke of, you know, there may be a time where, uh, where you may not be able to speak for yourself. Do you ever uh, counsel people on uh, their own trajectory and coming to terms with their own death? In other words, we're living in a time where the, um, you know, where the compassion and dying movement is sweeping the country slowly. And uh, so more and more states are enabling compassion and dying or physician assisted suicide. I like to speak of it as self deliverance uh, myself. And of course, people's views of this vary greatly. But it's my experience that people who have come to terms in their own way, whether philosophical or existential or spiritual or religious with their own deaths, that it's a much easier trajectory than for those who have not. Do you explore that with patients or counsel uh, your students to do so? Um, I do, and I think most of us on, on our team, which is now 15 physicians and seven advanced practice nurses, two chaplains and two social workers and two pharmacists, um, oftentimes I'll ask the chaplain to uh, come up and do, do some of that. We do not have physician assisted dying in Maryland, or the most Catholic of states. And I think it's going to be five, 10, 15 years before it's available. And I wax and wane on that. Um, I think it's far more important when, when you, as the oncologist or the cardiologist or the nephrologist, you can predict that this person's likely not going to live six months. To, have a talk with them and say, now's the time, if you want to, to do your legacy work. Now's the time to organize those photos that you have in shoeboxes from the 1950s. And you might be the only person who remembers who that who they, who they, who they, who, who they are. Uh, now's the time to go back to your hometown and see it one more time. Now's the time to you know, repair family fences if, if they're broken. Um, try to make it easier for your kids. That's what my wife and I are both trying to you know, downsize and get rid of a lot of stuff to make so our 34-year-old daughter doesn't have to um, move, <laughs> move all our stuff because we've done it before. So acknowledging and getting people to acknowledge that they have a limited lifespan, I think is the first step towards doing that legacy work. You mentioned uh, cannabis. Um, you didn't mention whether uh, you had views on whether CBD uh, or the total uh, cannabis plant is preferable for uh, pain reduction. There are very few studies of CBD and pain reduction. There are a lot more studies with THC, mm -hmm. uh, and you can make concentrations of THC in a mister, which looks an awful lot like a bong, um, that help with nerve pain, but don't give you the um, psychiatric side effects or make you feel high. You can usually find a, a common ground for that. I think one of the most interesting um, things to explore is psilocybin and, and things like it. Uh, Roland Griffiths, who ran the psilocybin program over at uh, Bayview Medical Center, three miles away from here, part of Johns Hopkins, um, he's done uh, guided trips for 12 hours with many, many, many patients. 
and almost to a person they say they feel more whole they feel more spiritual they feel more connected to the outside world um, and they don't feel so, nearly so alone it reduces what my psychiatrist friends would call death anxiety yes and in fact more broadly psychedelics is a immensely important field in uh, in personal development and in uh, managing suffering. Although I have to say, as with everything else, uh, there are downsides and dangers as well as potential. Mm -hmm. I'd right. like to ask Laura Pohl to join us. Um, she has done so much of our work on pain and uh, I know has some questions. Uh, Laura, uh, what would you like to ask Tom? Wow, Michael, you've managed to ask a lot of the ones I've written about, but um, Tom, um, what I hear about your presence with people, um, I wonder if you would speak a little bit about the power of presence and words uh, as sort of placebo versus nocebo effect uh, with, yeah. Sometimes even more than words is just being with the person and being silent. The pulling up a chair thing, tell me how things are going and doing the hardest thing for doctors and nurses to do, which is shut up. Uh, people will tell you, people will say, I am just so afraid of dying. I'm so afraid of being in pain. I'm so afraid of leaving my family. I'm so afraid of missing out on watching my grandkids grow up. So I think active listening is really, really important and not done enough. It, it, it's a teachable skill. I mean, when I was still down at the Medical College of Virginia, when I was in charge of the cancer floor, I would make the medical students, third and fourth year medical students, go in, pull up a chair, and talk to the patient for 15 or 20 minutes about anything other than their illness. So they really got to know who, who this person is. Absolutely. Um, I, I studied with uh, Dick Lucas down at um, the the VA Medical Center, and he was also in, down in uh, in Durham, North Carolina, and he was also at Duke. And he talked about the the nocebo effect of our words, and that when you're giving quote unquote hard news or bad news, um, people are in almost like a hypnotic, suggestible state. Uh, in other words, whatever you say, they're going to latch on to. And if the physician begins with words like, I'm sorry, there's nothing more we can do. And th that's the only thing the person hears. And beyond that, they may say to cure your cancer, but we're gonna do this and this and this. So th the person doesn't hear anything else. And so he talked about the power of those words um, and how they're presented and, um, and, and how that had sort of a nocebo effect. And I know in your, you know, your tattoo and that what you're teaching about communication, that must be, you know, conveyed to you, those you're training. But um, no, we, 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 we try to train people to, to listen. One thing pretty concrete that we have started doing, I started doing when I was still in Richmond. Um, I think I hold the, the record for the least amount of time spent in hospice. We got somebody enrolled, she took two breaths and then died. I think that's the world record. Um, ideally you'd like you know, three to six weeks, maybe even more. But now we teach all the fellows when you really think this person has a good chance of not being here in six months, you can still give third line chemotherapy, a fourth line chemotherapy and attend to their needs. But, and, you know, not but, and 
it's a good time to set up a hospice information visit. So let's say I'm in my own practice, let's say this is now our fourth line of chemotherapy and the last one only worked for about three months. So I know that's the situation's getting more serious. The patient may not, but I do for sure. So I'll, if they want to talk about prognosis, I'll do that. But I'll also say, and now's a good time for us to talk about hospice for if and when we need it. And I would like hospice to come out at your convenience and tell you what services they offer and what they don't offer. If you don't like that team that comes out, you can fire them and get another get another team. Um, most people who work in hospice are not the sort of get fired very frequently. Um, and our residents and a lot of the attendings have really picked up on that. It's such a simple and easy thing to do. So at the same point, you're saying, we don't have much left to offer you. You should be saying, and we can make sure your pain is relieved, make sure you have spiritual support, make sure you have as much social support as possible. Um, try to troubleshoot and fix any symptoms before they happen and keep you prepared all along the way. Yes, and um, I, I really relate with you about having someone, you get an order, emergency consult for hospice. When no, I mean, that, you really need it way back when, and, you know, people are, whether sometimes physicians uh, and or patients or families, um, you know, think that you, you have to wait until hospice and you're really on your deathbed for it, but they are such experts at managing not only physical pain, but the other pains that go along with nearing the end of your life. Um, and so, you know, it's it's a struggle, but if people would start earlier and um, and as you say, you can fire them or you can graduate from hospice if you know, thank goodness we were wrong about how long we thought you might live or, and, you know, and here you're doing so well. But I sort of like your pain pump study um, with uh, extended life, extended survival, they are finding that when people have good symptom management um, and people pay attention to their quality of life, that they live longer they in do. hospice. Yeah. There, there are two studies both well done, um, show people who use hospice compared to those who don't, perfectly matched. Hospice patients live about a month longer, lung cancer patients and pancreas cancer patients. Um, it doesn't cure anybody, but it, a month can be a long time if, if your quality of life is good. And Ethan Bosch has done two studies, one with at Sloan Kettering with 676 solid tumor patients with stomach cancer, colon cancer, breast cancer. Half of them got um, regular care from the team and half of them got an iPhone or a computer and they logged in their symptoms once a week. And there was a nurse, one nurse per shift, who watched this big panel and when somebody's pain spiked or the depression spiked or the constipation spiked, they would call them up. Close, close that loop, call them up and fix it either over the phone or bring them in for evaluation. And at the end of two years, the group that got the electronic monitoring lived six months longer. There was an absolute difference of six out of 100 people. That's a lot more than some of the drugs the FDA is approving. And it, <laughs> those curves continue you know, out six years, it's still six out of 100 people are alive because they have this constant symptom monitoring. He did the same study in uh, France on sabbatical with lung cancer patients. At the end of two years, 12 more patients were alive in the electronically monitored group, monitored group than in the usual care group. That's, that's a huge difference. Most, most of us don't have that capacity. But what we do have the capacity to do is say, 
Are you bothered by headaches? Are you bothered by trouble swallowing or chewing? Are you bothered by breathing troubles? Are you bothered by nausea or vomiting or constipation or diarrhea? So you can essentially do the same things that the person would do on their iPhone and, and put them on the problem list and, and try to fix them. Yes, and, and that's communication. And one of the things we stress in our pain uh, handbook uh, with cancer choices is telling people who are experiencing pain or other symptoms to report them early. I mean, they don't want to bother for so many reasons. They don't want to bother them. And it's catching it early. That's going to make such a difference in how it can be managed. Um, yep. Yeah. So, and, and, you know, people are afraid for whatever reason, bothering the doctor. Uh, speaking of afraid, um, you know, and people having these misconceptions about hospice, if I get in hospice, they're going to make me die sooner, which, you know, you've already shown that that's been uh, disproved. People actually live longer. But I wonder if you still see a lot of concerns, fears about taking opioids. Um, we do. And um, I often ask, well, what's been your experience with opioids? Baltimore has had historically one of the highest drug use problems in the country. When we first moved here, one in eight adults was actively using either heroin or cocaine. Um, so you have to take a, a drug history. Some people will say, hey, I've been clean for 20 years. There's no way I'm going back on opiates because I know exactly what's going to happen. I'm going to use that whole bit pill supply. And so we end up doing a lot of one week prescriptions and using a lot of buprenorphine um, and things that are harder to abuse. So I'll ask people, what, what are you so afraid of, of opioids? And sometimes it's addiction. Sometimes it's um, people who are religious are afraid of being beholden to something other than God. It's that, that's where it's nice to be married to a geneticist who's somewhat interested in these issues. She says, and I think the literature supports it, if you make it to 40 without being addicted to something, tobacco, alcohol, drugs, the chance of you getting addicted to normal painkillers somewhere less than one in a thousand. I mean, your body might get tolerant, but you've already shown that you're not an addictive personality. So I, when I explain it that way, people say, well, oh, okay, let's give it a try. Um, Tom, one of the, first of all, let me just start with a brief question. I hope you, the buprenorphine that you mentioned, I have a colleague out here who does a lot of work with addiction and he's quite convinced that the safety profile and, uh, pain relief potential of, uh, buprenorphine, uh, is, uh, is overlooked. Is that something that you would agree with? I would agree a lot. Um, people are afraid to prescribe it. They think they need a special license to prescribe it. Um, I have one young 40-ish year old woman with really bad metastatic breast cancer, and it really is the only drug that has made her life livable. I mean, just it's always a matter of pairing up the drug with the person's opioid receptors in their brain. Right. And Sometimes it takes you a couple of tries. Morphine might not do it. Oxycodone might not do it. Fentanyl might not do it. Buprenorphine or methadone might be a really good choice. So a broader question and a tough one. Uh, there are three books that have influenced me about that are critical of the whole direction of cancer research and treatment. Uh, Clifton Leaf's The Truth in Small Doses was a very major study of uh, cancer medicine. Uh, a recent book by V.K. Prasad called Malignant. He's on the faculty at UCSF, an oncologist. And a third book called The First Cell by Aza Raza, who's a professor of oncology at Columbia. And they all make a strong case that the, uh, essentially, that the power of the pharmaceutical industry 
has been such that um, that the direction of research and treatment uh, is not in the best interest of cancer patients. And um, for me, having just really studied these, there, there are two questions, I mean, two directions of questions. There's one study that I think Prasad and uh, Asa Raza cite uh, that came out after Clifton Lee's book uh, that where I think it was either Prasad or whoever was doing the research, they looked at 19 years of new uh, drug uh, approved FDA drugs for cancer and what was the median increase in survival. And it was 2.5 months, all right? And so both of these people, Prasad and uh, both oncologists, Prasad and Asaraza, uh, uh, say that there are a lot of very mediocre drugs being uh, approved uh, that, number one, are often infinitely more expensive than older drugs that do just as well or better, but just as well. Uh, and, and, and then they are promoted uh, heavily uh, because of uh, people's ties to the pharmaceutical industry. So you must have run into these questions, and it goes beyond pain medicine. But what is your own appraisal of the state of the direction of cancer treatment and cancer research in the United States, uh, given these kinds of critiques? In, I'm sure I have some biases because I've always worked at research institutions and I see my colleagues um, either with studies they've designed or studies that are drug company studies doing their absolute best to make, make things better for patients. Um, I think it's important to remember the median is not always a message because some people might get two and a half months, of, some people may get nothing, and other people may get two years, and we're, we're simply not very good at predicting who's who's going to respond in that way. Um, I've taken care of a lot of doctors in my day, and doctors will say, I'll take one cycle of chemotherapy. If it makes me too sick, I'm done. If it's helping and it I'm not too sick. I'll do another and then another and another, but we're going to reevaluate it at every cycle. And that's the way I think it should be done. Um, the more you know, I've had to relearn molecular biology and in my um, scrambler therapy work, I've had to relearn neurology and dust off the three cells that remained in my brain that remembered something about electrical engineering. Um, and biologic systems are just really, really complex. Complex, And you think you've got it, and then you realize there's another layer underneath, and there's another layer underneath. And there's, um, it's just not, not easy. Um, I, you do point out quite appropriately that uh, with people living longer and longer, they are accumulating toxicities. So more nerve damage, more heart damage, more lung damage, more GI distress. They're also accumulating more financial toxicity. I mean, if you're paying $17,000 for one drug for your recurrent colon cancer and $34,000 for another drug for your recurrent colon cancer because they work better as a team, um, your copay of 20% on that may completely bankrupt you. Um, and then there might be another option after that that gives the average person six months and it's it's not going to cost two hundred dollars it's going to cost seventeen thousand dollars the best prediction for the new price of a drug is the prices of the drugs that got approved before it and it's it's completely untransparent i mean you can't get into what um, you can't really figure out how much Amgen spent to make this drug. Um, and there are a lot of drugs that are you know, 300,000, 400,000, 1.2 million for a single person. Um, but there may only be 
50 kids in the United States with that particular disease. So it, in, that, in that case, it's probably justified to support the research necessary to do it. Mm-hmm. Well, we're in the last 15 minutes ma- maximum of our conversation. I just want to ask you, are there any topics that you would like to, uh, first of all, I cannot tell you how much we appreciate this because you're really opening up um, a, a tremendous number of areas for us to continue to explore in cancer choices and in all our work at Commonweal with cancer. Are there any broad areas that we have not touched on that, um, or specifics that uh, you would like to suggest we at least explore that? One thing is remembering that cancer or any serious disease is a family disease. Yes. So I, what I teach the fellows and the residents here is you pull up a chair and at some point during the interview, not the first question, but once you, we usually start with symptoms because they're safe. And then we'll move into, well, who's your support system? Mm-hmm. And try to you know, write that down. And are you a religious or spiritual person? Uh, yeah, I'm Catholic. Have you gone to church in the past couple of years? No, but uh, Father Jim knows me. Has Father Jim called on you? Or would it be okay if I called Father Jim and asked him to come make a house visit? Um, once you've had some of those conversations and get to know a person, you look people in the eye and say, your life has been turned upside down. How are you coping? And people will tell you, I'm doing the best I can. Every day is terrible. Every day is okay. Um, one a lot of people use this as a, as a growth opportunity to say, I've got a limited amount of time left. I'm going to be my best person. I'm going to uh, do some of the things I wanted to do, do that legacy work. And then after you've talked to the patient, I teach the fellows and residents to physically turn and face the family and say, you know, mom's been pretty sick for the past six months. How are you all coping with her situation? And they'll tell you. I've used up all my FMLA. Um, Now I'm using my vacation time. Um, I've had to drive her to six doctor visits in a week. Why can't you get them all together? Um, They'll tell you what's going on with their lives. And I can guarantee that will be the first time anyone has asked them about how they're coping. <laughs> My own experience, you know, having prostate surgery and then a quick recurrence and prostate radiation therapy and androgen, androgen deprivation and having all sorts of side effects. I had a, a TIA from it, which is associated with the drugs. You know, I lost half my lung function. Um, Felt terrible most of the time, just tremendous fatigue, just tremendous fatigue. And I went over to see one of the dermatologists, dermatologists, and I get seen in the in the, the residence clinic over there. And they have an attending of the day who's monitoring the, the residents. And he's looking at my chart. He walks in after the residents examine me, they're gonna burn a basal cell off my leg. Um, he's, he's looking at my chart and he's saying, you had a pretty tough year. How, how are you coping with that? And I, <laughs> it's the only time in my cancer history I've been asked that question. And I said, well, frankly, it's been a pretty crappy year. That's not exactly the word I use. It's been a pretty crappy year. And you could tell he just physically backed up. He was completely uncomfortable with taking it from, from there on in. But we, and he, he said, where's that spot on your leg? That was yeah. his response. Yeah. Uh, so teaching people to ask about coping is really important. When Jennifer Temmel did her lung cancer study at Mass General, 
where she took 157 lung cancer patients. Half of them got usual care and half of them got seen by a palliative care nurse, practitioner, or doctor once a month. Um, she had one of the medical students or residents go through the charts and look at how many times coping was mentioned. And there wasn't a single instance in the oncology alone charts of asking about coping. So that, that's something simple and easy you can, you can do. And not only that, but, but the simple fact is that quite often it's harder on the family members than it is on the patient. So, I mean, the question about coping is, is profound. They may be suffering at least as much, if not more. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, uh, one of our uh, friends on the call asked, are there any book recommendations for a terminal patient and their immediate families? Are there any book, book recommendations? recommendations? Yeah. Um, Jane Brody's Guide to the Good Great Beyond I think I have a copy of it over here. Uh, She's a New York Times uh, uh, health correspondent, one of the great New York Times health correspondents. So we've done a lot of important work. Jane Brody's A Guide to the Great Beyond. Um, a little dated now. I think it's probably 10 years old, but everything in it is still there. Wonderful. Um, Wonderful. The other thing I picked up right next to it is Jane Kenyon's book of poems called Otherwise. Oh, wonderful. So if you, I got out of bed on two strong legs. It, I can't read it without wonderful. hearing that. Tom, you mentioned that you're a Quaker. Um, is that a tradition uh, profoundly important to you or sort of medium? Uh, I would say medium. Uh Um, I mean, I became, I started going to friends meeting when I was, uh, I think, 12. I was, had been dragged to the Methodist church by my parents and our sixth grade um, Sunday school teacher said we should just nuke Vietnam back to the Stone Age. And that somehow didn't seem right to me, (laughs) even at that young age. And I got reading about the American Friends Service Committee and then found out that there was a Quaker meeting in Wadsworth, Ohio, started going there um, when I was working for the Ohio Department of Natural Resources in Columbus. I went to Quaker meeting there um, and then we went to Friends meeting in in Richmond off and on. Uh, And then I joined the meeting here. So... What is the framework, if it's only kind of medium important to you, how do you describe what matters most to you? What is your sort of orienting framework in your personal life and your work that um, that you can put into words? What, how, how do you do it? Um, I think it's family first. Mm-hmm. Um, my wife of 40 plus years and our daughter who's 34 and a gynecologic oncology resident at the University of Pennsylvania, still trying to be a good dad and not, not embarrass her or her husband. Um, not screw up too much in my last uh, year or two here. Mm-hmm. So after that, it's right now for me, one of the biggest things is succession who's going to lead this program as I'm stepping down because I'll be at 40% next year. Um, And right now there are seven openings for directors of palliative medicine in the United States. Um, Mm. There aren't that many middle-aged people who um, either want to do the job or have thought about it. So succession is a big worry for me right now. I thought I understood that palliative care was one of the really hot areas that was attracting a lot of uh, young, compassionate doctors. So I'm 
surprised that there's a shortage of people who want to lead these clinics. Um, you're right. Um, Rebecca Kirsch, who was very much involved with um, palliative care, still is, and the Center to Advance Palliative Care, said palliative care is the hot chick in high school. <laughs> um, mm. And so it, we're getting better and better applicants. We, you know, we have 100 plus applicants for five physicians here, and um, they come here because it's Hopkins, and we have a good good training program, and they go on, at least half of them go on to academic or semi-academic jobs. So that there's been this expansion over the past five years of the number of fellowships. What there aren't is a whole bunch of people in their 40s and 50s who um, either want to lead a program or have the administrative research and educational and clinical skills to do it. I agree. I, I I'd like to ask Laura Paul to come back with us for the last few minutes. And uh, Tom, I'm just so moved by this. I knew it was going to be an important conversation for us. But um, when you speak of of how, and Laura speak of how important someone's presence is, your presence is extraordinary. I know that it must be for your patients and your colleagues, but there, there's just a, forgive me for saying it, I, even through the mechanism of a Zoom call, there's, there's a sense of the power of your presence that is uh, palpable. And um, I'm just honored that you've been willing to share, you know, almost two hours of your time with us. And I can promise you that this will uh, inspire us because we we deeply believe, as you said, that, that palliative care should be a fundamental part of oncology. And it's moving in that direction, but it still has a long way to go. So, uh, Laura, before I do a close with Tom, last words from me. Um, I, I have a, something on my mirror I put up after I got post-herpetic pain from shingles this fall. Didn't think I'd be able to make it through. It was pretty rough. And I put up this, uh, these words, you can endure almost any how if you have a why. And I think one of the things we can do in being compassionate is help people explore and find that why and um anyway i just thought i'd bring that up because sometimes it's pretty rough to make it through something that you don't know is going to get under control that you don't have the hope uh that it can be helped well that quote is from nietzsche those who have a why to live can bear most anyhow you know tom any last words for us well, thank you for allowing me to to do this. It's great fun. We're just very grateful. Thank you for being with us. Kira, do you want to come back on? Thank you, Tom and Michael and Laura and Nancy behind the scenes and Ken behind the scenes helping us with production. Just one more reminder that we have a whole series of Cancer Choices co-presented conversation recordings on a variety of integrative cancer care topics and you can find them on either of our websites. So thank you all for being with us today at the New School at Commonweal, and we'll see you next time. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, Kira. Don't take it, don't, 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 don